Greetings, intrepid explorers of obsolete tape technology. If there is a prize for the most brutally complex mixer that Tascam ever made, I would personally award it to the Tascam Porta Studio 488. This is prompted partly by interactions with a viewer who is struggling to understand how to route the signal through this mixer. And it's not hard to see why that is confusing. Basically, the pan control has effect on it, and then these assign buttons have an effect on it, and then that goes from the pan control to the assign button to the master fader. And then finally, uh, we need to worry about how these record function buttons are settled. And so you've got one, two, three, four different factors. And if any of those factors don't agree with each other, then your signal isn't going to get where you thought it was going to get. So I'm going to do a bit of a walk through this. Uh, we're going to start with the simplest use case, which is the, the signal that's coming in on mixer channel one is going to tape track one. And, uh, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is that distinction between a mixer channel and a tape track. Because you hear people talking about channels and tracks like they're interchangeable and they're not really. And so then we'll go on to put a signal into channel two and put it to track two and so on until we filled all eight tracks. Then we'll go on to some more unusual use cases. Like for instance, I'll try and take the signal from input one, but maybe record it to let's say track six, um, because you can do that. Um, I'll also look at recording multiple tracks at once. You can record up to four tracks at the same time. And also doing things like recording more than one mixer channel and blending it onto one tape track. So you could record like eight drum microphones and you could blend them in mono and put them all onto one track so you've still got seven tracks open on your cassette player. Hopefully anyone who's got one of these units referring to this video, they can kind of make sense of where the signals are going through this. <laughs> Right, so first thing we're going to do, the most simple use case, is just how we get a signal coming from an input and going onto the cassette player. So let's just turn this on. And now we can uh, squint through tired eyes at this dim, not backlit LCD screen. Now, I should emphasize that although I will be doing some recording with this, like nice music, music you might want to listen to. And this one, the sound sources I'm going to be using are kind of incidental. They're just there to prove that actually audio is passing through it. So in my case, um, for this first part of the demonstration where I'm putting a signal into input one, so it reaches track one on the cassette player and so on, I'm just going to be using this Fostex Model TT15. It's a test tone generator. So really this is here to send out like a minus 10 dB or 0 dB signal uh, for test purposes. So when you hear it, it's just going to be a sound. It's not going to be doing anything interesting musically whatsoever. So anyway, I'll put that onto a 1 kilohertz tone. And because that red light is on, then that should show us that its signal is getting through. So that's going to be off to the side here. I've just hooked up my speakers in the room, two of the outputs on the back. Um, so you can now hear the test tone coming through. Now because this is outputting at minus 10 dB, you see that switch on the test generator? That's line level. So it actually should be a pure sinusoidal tone, like a wave like that, when that's down at line. And as I turn it up, you can hear more overtones, more harmonics, because basically what's happening is when it's saturated, the top of that sine wave is getting sawn off, and so it's becoming a square wave, and a square wave has more harmonics, so it acts a bit like a fuzz pedal. Anyway, um, let's turn that back up so we can hear the pure tone. What happens here is if I put this input assign into off, we can no longer hear the tone, and the signal is no longer getting through to the screen here. Now, if I hit that to group one, if I arm group one over here, so that there's a flashing oval above track one in this track meter display, you can see the signal's got through. Um, so I can make that louder or quieter by adjusting the master fader. Notice, that in this mode, the channel fader doesn't make any difference. When I'm set to group one, it's going straight from the input 
to the master fader. And the EQ doesn't make any difference. And the pan doesn't make any difference. So it's almost like it's bypassed all of this and it's going straight from here to here. Then that is controlling the level that's received by tape. And that's what that display is showing you. Whereas if I go to mix, notice when I turn the pan control to the right, the signal, which is affected by the channel mixer, disappears from the left hand channel. And in fact, if I arm group two by pressing the group two button in this area, so that there's an oval flashing above that track, you can see that that signal, I'll turn it up a bit, has reappeared but it's in track two. So the, the pan control, when you are in mix mode, has an effect on where the signal is going. If I just turn this down slightly and distort it slightly, it'll make it easier to hear what the EQ is doing to it. If I put this on a lower frequency, you can hear that the low EQ is now having an effect. So basically, these switches at the top must be in mix mode if you want the signal to pass through the mixer on its way to tape. But it is possible to send the signal from this input directly to the fader where it will appear on the track meter. And if your unit is properly calibrated, then that is the level of signal that you should print to tape. Right, next thing for us to wrap our heads around is what this assign button does here. This, these are the pairs of buttons that are above the channel faders. And you know, there's one for each channel of the mixer. One says one slash L two slash right, and the other says three dash four. If we're up here, because it does relate to the switch at the top, at the moment it's off, so we can't hear the signal. I put it on group one. And we can hear the signal again. It doesn't matter when I press this. It's not cutting the signal in and out. So long as I'm in group one. Because remember, this switch is sending this straight to this fader. So this fader, master fader, that's labelled one left, two right, is having an effect on the sound that three, four isn't. Now if I switch that over to mix, and I push in button one, two, see how it appears in both of these tracks on the meter well, that's because the pan controls in the middle if I turn that over right well it says even on it and then it goes to the even number right two is an even number it goes over there if I turn this pan control to the left look it appears in the number one now if I take this button one two off and put on button three four and I turn up the three four fader look what's happened it's appeared and tracks three, four. And now if I turn to the right, it's only going to track four. And if I go to the left, it's only going to track three. So in mix mode, everything in that particular channel strip, including the pan control and the assign button, works in conjunction with the master. Now what if we press down both of these buttons and turn up both of these faders? Now our signal is appearing in both track one and track three. And if I swap over the RCA outputs again, it's audible again. And we've got a duplicate and we can send that maybe to an external mixer. The person who's recording this sound can monitor their sound through an external headphone mixer. Or maybe we want to make a digital and an analogue recording at the same time. So that would allow us to send a duplicate of that signal to a digital recorder at the same time that we're recording to cassette. I realise that these aren't necessarily very practical use cases, but I'm trying to impress upon you just how powerful and flexible this mixer is. But that power and flexibility comes at the expense of it's an absolute bastard to get your head around, I think, to begin with. Next, let's talk in a little bit more detail about how this section works. That is the record function buttons and how the meters respond to them. 
So I'm turning up the master fader at the moment. I'm in mix mode. I'm pan to the right and I'm assigned to both group one, two and three, four. So they're pressed down, by the way, if that wasn't clear, on is pushed down, up is turned off. That's how those toggle buttons work. Now, if this signal is going to be audible anywhere, whether that's through the headphone or through these outputs on the back, they're just off screen and pointing at them, then it will appear in this monitor bus. Now the monitor bus is uh, partly dependent on these buttons here, these monitor buttons. So if I turn off, for instance, group two, you can see that uh, the signal disappears from these. So to a certain extent, this side of it is just telling you whether the signal that you're putting in is getting to this monitor section. In order to see what level of signal is going to hit the tape, then we need to arm one of the tracks. So we do that by using these record function buttons. Now, if I press two, cause I'm pan right, and assign one, two is pressed in on track one, then that signal now appears on track two. If I press it again, it disappears. And I press it again and it reappears. And this flashing oval with the number two above it indicates that uh, the track is armed for recording. If I were to start recording on the tape, then that signal would be going to track two. Whereas if I depress it, then the fact that it's recording doesn't matter. Um, no information on the cassette will be written over. No new information will be printed. Alternatively, I can press number six. You see how that same signal is now being routed to track six of the tape recorder? And press it again. Come on. So unresponsive this button, I might need to resolder that. But anyway, and it disappears. I press it and it reappears. But these are buttons are also in mutually exclusive pairs. Like I can assign that signal to group two or group six, but not both. So this is the next thing you need to get your head around. Right, we can assign signals to these one of these four or these four but not at the same time so i can't record to track one and five i can't record to track two and six it's got to be one or the other i can't record to track three and seven it's got to be one or the other i can't record to tracks four and eight it's got to be one or the other so what combinations does that give us i could record to track one and track two and track seven and track four at the same time. Or I could make that three and I could change this one so it's tracks one, three, four, and six. You see what I mean? We can record some kind of combination of four tracks, but there are these mutually exclusive pairs and the way the buttons work, you can toggle them on and off or you can press the opposing number. So I can go straight from number two being active to number six being active. If I want to just neither of those to be active, I can press six. Or if I've got two pressed, press two again. And that's it, deselected. Next thing we're going to discuss are these tape knobs that are right near the top. And as you might expect, this is to do with the signal that's coming back off tape. And they behave in a slightly unintuitive way where at 12 o'clock, if you move it, you can actually feel there's a notch there. No signal from tape is going anywhere. If it's being sent to the right, then it's going to cue. Now, what does that mean, going to cue? What you've got to think is that what you hear as a performer while you're recording, it's important that that is kept separate from what the tape hears. Let's say that we've just recorded a guitar on here, right? And now we're overdubbing bass on track two. Now, we want to be able to hear the guitar so we can play along with it in time. But we don't want the sound of that guitar to be recorded onto track two in combination with bass. That would be a bouncing situation. In this case, we want this to be cued and then we would enable cue in this monitor section. And that would mean that in our headphones, we would be able to hear the guitar at the same time we were playing our bass. And that way we can keep our playing in synchronization with the musical material that's already been recorded. If we turn that in the other direction, however, then the tape signal is going through the mixer and potentially we can record that 
onto another part of the tape. And this is where bouncing comes in. If you're not familiar with bouncing, it's a way of enabling you to uh, record more layers of sound than you have tape tracks. So it's more important than something like a four track because four tracks isn't actually very many layers of music. So what you might do is record a bass, a guitar and drums, and then you bounce all three of those to the track four, meaning that you can overwrite what was in tracks one, two, and three with three vocal parts. And uh, these are the sorts of techniques that were used in very early recordings, you know, the Beatles and things like this, where you're hearing very complex arrangements, but it was only a four track tape machine, although, you know, in a much more elaborate tape format than a cassette. So even on this more complex eight track machine, that's still possible. So, you know, we could do things like record four drum microphones, and then we could bounce that as a stereo pair to track seven and eight. Then we can overwrite tracks one, two, three, four with guitars and we've still got two tracks left for a bass and a vocal. That kind of idea. So these are the sorts of circumstances where we would turn this tape control to the left. That way um, we can EQ it, uh, we can affect the level of it using the channel fader, but then we can send it. Let's role play here. I want it to go to track two. I want to bounce the signal to track two. Um, then I would turn pan control to the right I would assign the track one, two button, push that down. I'd make sure this fader was up, I'd make sure this fader was up, I'd make sure two was recording. And then what happens is I'm making a copy of what was on track one of the tape and duplicating it to track two. But you can do this in combination. You reduce like six tracks of signal. So they only take up two tracks or one track and that leaves you space to add more and more layers of complexity to your musical arrangement. So that is what that, those tape controls are for. Choosing whether we're just listening along with what's on the tape because we're overdubbing, so overdubbing to the right, or whether we're sending it back through to bounce the recorder. So if you think to the right, overdubbing, to the left, bouncing. Next thing we should try and wrap our heads around is how the effect sends work on this. So you see that each one of these mixer channels has got this effect knob. So that kind of follows on from how the tape knob works because again, it's one of these ones that's got an indent that you can feel at 12 o'clock. So you can either turn it to the right, which is effect send two, or turn it to the left, which is effect send one. And then over here to the right, there's an overall level for that effect send. So yeah, let's role play this. We've got a reverb that's going to effect send one. So this is the overall level, how hot, what we're sending a reverb is. So here we've got like four drum channels. So we're like turning them up various amounts. Like maybe these are the room mics, so we give them more reverb, but then this is the kick drum and the snare, so we give them less reverb. And then we're turning this effect one send. So the, the overall level of drum reverb is not so hot that it distorts the reverb, but not so cold that we've got too much hiss. That signal is gonna come out of effect send one, which is up in yonder corner to the left. What we would expect to then do with the output of the reverb is to bring it on in one of these two stereo inputs here. These have assign buttons, one, two, three, and four, and level controls. The way that those behave are very much how the assign button and channel faders worked in the mix mode for that we already discussed for the channel. So let's talk about some of the pros and cons of this. It's good that there are two channels of effect. It is a compromise that we can't send the channel, let's say this contains a guitar, we can't send it to a reverb on the left and an echo on the right. We have to choose to have reverb or echo and not both. The other disadvantage of this system is that there's not much control over where the effect sits in the stereo image. Right, let's imagine that uh, where my hand here is on the left is your left ear as you're listening in headphones and where my hand here is on the right is the right hand side. So there's almost a stereo image going from left to right. And so this is the sound of the guitar and this is the reverb for the guitar. On some units, you can have the reverb from the guitar on the opposite side. So like the dry guitar is going in your left ear and the sound of the reverberation is going into your right ear. That's not something you can do without extra stuff on this unit. Like if there are pan controls built into your reverb unit, then you can do it that way. You know, if you can affect the balance of whether the input is going to the left 
or right output of your reverb pedal, let's say, uh, then that will be reflected in this stereo input here and then you're just controlling the level of it. But yeah, you do need some sort of external mixer or some sort of effects unit with effectively mixer facilities built into it in order to be able to make that distinction between where the reverberation and the source sit in the stereo image. Uh, without those extra facilities, then, you know, if you're... Guitar signals over here, that's where your reverb is. If your guitar signals over here, that's where your reverb is. Apart from that, not a lot uh, else to say about that really. Um, this affecting of things is something that you can do during tracking. That is when you're first making a recording. You can do it during overdubbing. You can do it during bouncing. Or you can do it during the final mix down. And I mean, you could do it in all four parts of the recording process if you wanted. Um, that would be a way to work around the shortcoming I was talking about where you're choosing either echo or reverb. Maybe when you're tracking you put on reverb, but then when you bounce you add echo and then when you mix you add compression. If you plan it out in advance then there's an awful lot of flexibility you can get out of a mixer like this, but you know, again it's that trade-off between it's flexible, it's powerful, but that makes it kind of harder to understand and learn. In this section of the video, what I'm going to do is actually narrate the entire process of making some recordings. Now, as I think I mentioned earlier in the video, there will be a proper demonstration recording of music that you might actually want to listen to that I make on this uh, recorder. Uh, sometime soon and I suppose when I make that video I'll be focusing more on the creative sequence uh, of you know oh, oh maybe I'm gonna put down bass first oh, and then I'm gonna add drums afterwards you know those sorts of things but I'm gonna focus during this demonstration very much on where I am setting controls and the actual recording that I'm going to be making is going to be much more incidental, much less interesting to listen to. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the group direct mode of each of these channels and I'm going to record a test tone from the little Fostex tone generator onto this tape. And the reason I'm doing that is actually quite practical. I don't know if you can see that I've got this tape up here. I've written PB level. The reason that I've done that is I've already calibrated the playback level. So if I put in this test tape, you're going to see some pretty even levels coming back on the meter. I mean, you can see a couple of them are like, you know, maybe a slightly less than 3 dB down, but it's pretty even. It's within factory specifications. The, the only thing that I have left to do on this unit, though, is to see whether the test recordings match the input level. So it should be that if I record a signal at minus three decibels, it plays back at minus three decibels. If it's hotter than that, I need to turn down the record amplifier. If it's colder than that, then I need to turn up the record playback amplifier. So that's how I've got these little segments here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I can make notes to myself about how much variation there is between the input signal and the signal coming back from tape and uh, that will be my guide on how to adjust the trim pots when I open this back up which will be the final stage of refurbishing this unit. Pretty much blank tape, I'm calling it 8 track test tape because I don't want to mix up with my uh, 4 track stuff. I'm just going to fast forward on a bit, press counter reset so we've got some arbitrary point zero, and I can start making test recordings okay. So you can hear that, um, I'll use the uh, one kilohertz signal and that's now coming in through input one and I'm going to assign it to group one you can see it's appearing in the monitor here again to remind you assign in this mode does nothing the channel fader does nothing but the master fader does make a difference so if I arm track one you can see the signal coming through it's a bit quiet so what I'm going to do is just adjust the master fader until just below where zero decibel lights. So that's, you see it flashing, and want it constant like that. That shows me that the signal that's hitting tape is minus three decibels. Because that's armed, if I now place play and record, that should record the signal to tape. So I'm going to let this run up to maybe 15. Now let's say 20, press stop, okay, turn that signal off for now, press RTZ here, that's return to zero, now if I unarm group one, press play, 
you could see it was there, but it's quite quiet. It was minus 10, so that does need to be turned up quite a bit. So I'm going to write in this box minus 10. Next one, I'm going to turn that track off just to be safe. I'm going to go to input 2, set to group 2. So it's going straight to this master fader. This master fader's up, so no problem. Arm track 2. Adjust that so we're at minus 3 dB. Hit return to zero. Hit record. Pressing both those buttons simultaneously, play and record. You can see that that's playing alongside the recorded signal on track one. I'm gonna take it all the way to 30. I think that's a longer signal to look at. Right, I can turn that off. I'm gonna set that off so it's safe. Unarm that track. Turn to zero, press play. So it flashed a bit louder. It's coming up to minus three, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's you know, nearly minus 10 as well. It's weird that it's jumping by two there, but yeah, that needs to be turned up as well. I'm going to call that minus six, okay? So I uh, know to turn that pot up not as much. Turn to zero. Let's go into channel input three, moving it to group three. So it's going straight to here. The three, four mixer is turned down, so I need to turn that up. Now, we may have a problem here. Let's see if we can get any response out of it any other way. Hmm, we might have an actual problem with the input there. I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. So we'll, we'll pass over that one for now. Let's go to, there we go. Input number four. And uh, that is going straight to this fader here. I need to turn on group three and four in the monitor section for it to appear in this left right monitor bus here uh, but if I just arm group 4 I'll unarm group 3 turn that up a bit till we're just at minus 3 dB let's hit record and play that's up, meters up to 30 so I'll stop there unarm that, turn that sound off for now, set that to off just for safety hit RTZ, go back to zero, press play okay now this one is fine Okay, that's at minus 3 dB, so I can put a wee tick in my box there to remind myself I don't need to adjust that one. The playback level is the same as the record level, that's what we want. Track 5. Ah, now we're coming to something interesting. Well, now you just noticed this actually, uh, it must be a while since I've used this unit. Channels 5, 6, 7, 8 of the mixer, the right hand option here is not group. There is no direct group assigned. Um, what we have instead is either Q, meaning that I suppose that we can listen to what's coming on in this input. So say we've got a drum machine that we want to hear in our headphones where we're not actually recording it. Or we add it to the mix. And so that's back to this whole thing of using the pan control in conjunction with the assign buttons, in conjunction with the channel fader, in conjunction with the master fader. And that's how we route the signal to the cassette recorder in order to record it. Uh, so on this occasion, I'm gonna set it to mix. We're going to track five, so that's an odd number. So we turn the pan to the left. Track five is associated with group one. So we want to have a sign number one pushed down and we want to have this master fader turned up. So if I press that, you can now see the uh, turn up in the monitoring bus here. And I think if I swapped over where the RCA outputs are connected, yeah, we, we can hear it out uh, there as well. Now, if I press five there, that's arming it. And then I can make fine adjustments to the level of the signal using this master fader. There again, I've got it at minus three dB. I'm at zero um, on the counter, so I can just record there. And look how we can see the previous uh, three tracks that we've recorded. That'll do. So I can turn off my uh, tone generator again. I can set that off for safety. Return to zero. Terrible temptation to press counter reset, which is not what we want. Track arm for channel five off using this button. Press play. Okay, so quite a clear signal, but it's minus six. And so that one would definitely need to be turned off a bit. So let's... Go to track six. 
I'm actually, while I think of it, you know, this is part of my uh, process for testing things. I've got a question mark here over input socket number three. So I've just put a bit of red tape beside there to remind myself for later that that's something I need to attend to. I replaced some of these input sockets, but not others. That whole board with these sockets was quite badly damaged when I received this. So what I suspect there is that that socket there also needs to be replaced. Anyway, we want to put input assigned to six. Six is an even number, so I'm turning the pan control to the right. If we look over here at these groups, track six is associated with group two, so it's one, two assign button that we want on. Turn that fader up, turn on the tone generator. We can see that signal is appearing in the monitor section of this. And then if we arm number six, we, we can see that uh, the signal is getting through to the tape player. So I'm just going to adjust that so it's at minus three. You look so at the recordings being that's made alongside the recordings that I made earlier. Hit record. That's us at 30, so we can stop. Turn my tone generator off. Set this to off for safety. Disarm the channel. Return to zero. Press play. So yeah, the signal's there, but again, we're at minus six decibels, so that is going to need to be turned up. What I tend to find with these, I don't know why that is but i rarely find that i need to turn down record amplifiers if i've got an old machine then what i find is usually i need to turn all those record amplifiers up and there's even a thing that i would tend to do i haven't done it on this unit with like the tr i turn the trim pots fully to the right which is as loud as possible and then turn it back a quarter turn and if i remember to do that then i tend to find that the levels are much closer to what i would expect them to be for for calibration purposes and uh, the adjustments i need to make after that point are much finer but because i'm getting such low levels in most of these tracks then yeah i'm inclined to think that i didn't do that when i had this one open anyway let's put a signal onto track eight again we're in mix mode seven is an odd number so we want the pan control to be the left so it's assign button three four we want to have pushed in turn up that fader the master fader is already up turn on the tone generator and look there we are we can see that the signal is appearing in the monitor section the reason we can't hear it is because of where these rca sockets at the back are plugged in i plug in the other one and there we go we can hear it again okay i'm gonna arm track seven you can see that signal appear in the track meter now just fiddle with the master fader just to get it at minus three db and hit record it's us way over 30 now press stop turn off the tone generator make sure that the assigned input is off for safety's sake disarm track seven for safety's sake you can see that the oval is no longer flashing there uh hit return to zero rtz press play let's see where we are yeah about the same minus six so yeah just needs to turn up a little bit right press stop turn to zero track eight mix mode eight is an even number turn it to the eight turn the fader for that channel up i can turn these other ones down channel eight is associated with group four so we need to depress assign button three four the master for three four is still up so now if i press the tone generator on you can see it appearing in the monitor section because group four in the monitor section of buttons here is pushed down if i arm track eight hmm we don't have a signal getting through to tape now why would that be i want to just quickly talk about why i got confused about thinking that there's no signal getting through to track eight because it is it's fine this is a unit that has a sync capability so one of the things we're going to see in the back here is this sync it's upside down obviously but out in off on i've just turned it off it was on before when that sync is turned on track eight of the cassette player isn't connected to the mixer anymore it's connected to those outputs in the back and the point of that is that you can record an fsk signal which is a kind of synchronization signal that's used as a sort of intermediate step so that back in the day when uh, midi and digital audio workstation and yada 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 weren't so well integrated uh, one of the ways that we would integrate uh, cassette 
with MIDI gear is that you would give up one of your tracks, track eight, as a synchronization track. That way, if there are little variations in the pitch or we move the pitch control uh, here, then the MIDI gear would change tempo accordingly. So that was why this signal wasn't getting through. I just had disconnected that track of the tape from the mixer inadvertently. So um, we will now record this tone so just adjust that so it's at minus three decibels uh, we're at zero um, so hit record stop okay and turn that tone generator off it's just off to the side of the screen here let's move that back in that's where the sound's coming from still return to zero disarm track eight uh, turn the input assign for channel eight of the mixer to off to be safe and when we press play, that one's actually coming up to minus three, so that one probably doesn't need to be turned up so much. So I'll make a note to myself. Channel three, we didn't record anything on. So if you remember, that was because I thought that socket was broken. Uh, but just as a kind of example, what I can do is just record two track eight from mixer channel two. That's completely possible. So let's make that happen. For that, I can't be in group mode. That won't work. I need to be in mix mode. Track three is an odd number. So I turn that to the left, push this up. Track three is under group three. So it's three and four uh, is the button that I want to push down, the assign button that I want to push down. You can see that it's now coming up in the, the monitor section. And if I arm three, and uh, you can see that it's appearing there so if i just turn that down so we're at minus three decibels we're at zero on the counter let's record okay so i'm going to turn off the tone generator for safety i'll turn down mixer channel two and I'll put the input assign to off i will disarm the track so that what the meter is showing me is the signal coming back from tape hit return to zero press play there we go, and yeah, that one's sitting at about minus six. So yeah, that's not too bad, really. Okay, so what have we demonstrated so far? Um, how we can use the direct to group switches for channels one through four. So that means that we don't go through the mixer channel at all. It goes straight over here to the master fader, and then we use the record, record function buttons in order to assign them to tracks. So in that way we can use these four inputs to bypass the mixer completely and just record directly with a little bit of pre-amplification to the cassette player. And uh, by using these buttons that gives us access to any of the eight tracks. We can record up to four of them at a time. Any combination of tracks one, two and three, four or five, six, seven and eight. You know, they're in these mutually exclusive pairs where you can record one or five but not both, two or six but not both, three or seven but not both, four or eight or not both. I think probably the next thing to do is to just show how we use the mixer to listen back to what is on the tape. Now, it's gonna be a bit boring to listen to all those test tones. So I'm going to remove that cassette and we're going to use Cold Cuts by Drome and the Brothers Nylon. I highly recommend both bands, Drome and Brothers Nylon. And I recommend that you go to their band camp and buy their stuff and buy their physical media. I did a video a while back that shows how 8-track heads that Tasca made and the 4-track heads that Tasca made split the tape into different regions and it's not completely compatible. So what we're going to find here, some of the audio is coming back on some of the channels, but not others. So look, we're getting playback on tracks one and two, and seven and eight, but we're not getting any playback on tracks three, four, five, and six, okay? Because I don't have a pre-recorded eight track tape, we're gonna have a little bit of difficulty in uh, demonstrating all eight tracks, but I can at least show you how to play back tracks one, two, three, and four. So let's start with channel one here. Uh, because track one of the tape is playing back on channel one. I want to set that to mix. I want to turn it up. I want to assign the button to the one, two fader since that is the corresponding RCA outputs that I'm plugged into, that I have my speakers plugged into. Now, if I turn the tape control over to the left, we can hear the music. Now it's very fast 
because that's a one and seven eight inches per second recording, and this is a three and three quarter eight inches per second tape player. So if I turn down the pitch control, that's a little bit more like what the artist intended. Okay, so that's like the uh, left hand side of the forward direction of this tape. Um, it was actually coming out of my right hand speaker because look, I've got this pan control set over to even. So I set it over to odd. And I think this uh, camera is picking it up in stereo, so you, can, you should be able to hear that the sound on that side of the image now. Okay, so let's get the other part of that stereo image up. So up here, input a sound, we want that to be mix. We want to turn the tape control from this, away from this zero position to the left to mix. And we want to assign it, not to master bus three, four, but to master bus one, two. Turn the fader up, pan it to the right, Press play, let's hear. So there we go, we've got just that. And when we combine it, we've got stereo image. On track seven and eight, we're probably going to have the B side of the cassette going backwards. If you want an explanation of why it's like that, again, refer to this video, I'll put a link in the description so you can find it. So I want to go input assign mix. I want to assign this to the one, two, master fader. I want to turn this up. Then if I turn tape to the left, hear that, I've got backwards audio coming out of that speaker. But at this point, the pan control is no longer a signal assignment tool. It's just placing the signal from tape in a stereo image between the left and the right. Do a similar process for the other half of that stereo image. So I want the input assignment to go to the mix. I want the signal to come out on the right hand side. I want it to be going to the one, two master fader. I turn that on that channel and then turn the tape control to the left. That makes it louder. And if I blend that with the other one, you can hear the entire stereo image. Now if I turn up these two as well, you can hear the forward information and the backwards information at the same time. Why would you want to do that? Well, no real good reason, uh, because it's not a multi-track recording. But if you'd recorded four instruments on those four tracks, then that would be a way for you to listen back to all four of them simultaneously and, you know, make a stereo image. Maybe you've got, like, a bass over here and you've got a drum machine over here and your vocals in your centre and your tambourine somewhere in the middle there. I don't know. It's your choice, man. It's your music. Next thing I'm going to demonstrate, a couple of things involving recording multiple sources simultaneously, bouncing those sources, reducing like three tracks into one track. And then I'm also going to demonstrate that we can actually record up to eight signals uh, and down to four tape tracks. <laughs> These are the sound sources that I'm using. Um, here's this little Nano Mini Pops drum machine that was given by a viewer. It sounds like this. See that's going through to track four. I've got this pocket operator speak. Okay, so that's assigned to tape track two. And then on track one, I've got, I've forgotten the name of the maker, but there's this little digital synth. It does a lot of stuff. I've got it making this sound. Now, in combination, is this great music? Uh, no, it's not. It's just for demo purposes. But together, this sounds like this. It's not in time with itself. It's a weird combination. It's quite atonal. But point is, I'm going to record all three of these to tape. And then I'm going to make a mono blend of them onto track six to show you how that works. Then I'm going to make a stereo blend of them on the track seven and eight. So, you know, maybe I'll have the uh, pocket reader operator off to the left. I'll have the red synth off to the right and the drum machine in the middle. And so as a pair, we'll have this like stereo image on seven and eight. But then I'll also have this monaural one where it's all three of them at a certain balance, but um, there's no separation in a stereo image. And then <laughs> I'll do something else where I actually just record a blend of all three of them in mono to track five. 
Why would you want something like that? Well, um, I suppose, what if you want to record eight channels of drum mics, but you're not bothered about having a stereo drum file? And, uh, you know, you're kind of happy that the mix might end up a bit wonky because you're burning it straight to the tape and you can't control it afterwards. It would be completely feasible with this unit to take those eight dynamic mics and blend them to up to four tape tracks. So I'll demonstrate that as, uh, as well. So first thing we're going to do is we're just going to record this blend of funny uh, electronic signals. Now we'll play back the recording. So let's set it off running. So you can see they're all flashing away. So I'm going to hit record. Fade out, stop. Okay, turn to zero. Let's turn the input assign off those tracks. Turn them up. We're going to make sure they're all assigned to one, two. And we're going to turn these tape controls over. So if I unplug these, now you can see that it's coming back on tape here and signal individually. So there we go, we've made the multi-track recording, we have the ability to change the EQ of the sounds separately. We can pan them separately, like we can pan this, it's in the right speaker, it's in the left speaker, it's in the centre. So let's make a, a stereo image of that first of all, I'm going to put the dark drum machine in the middle. I'm going to put this off to the right and put this off to the other side. So we've now got this image where that is kind of on the left. That's off to the right and then this funny little drum machines in the centre. So next thing is we're going to bounce this. Well, how do we achieve that? Remember earlier I was talking about how these tape controls work? If we turn them to the right, then they're going into a cue mix that is really going only going into the headphones. But if we turn it to the left, then it's taking the tape signal and moving it through the mixer. Um, so that means we can assign it to other tracks. So if you look what I've got here, I've got these turned up. I've actually uh, swapped over where the uh, RCA outputs are so that you can uh, hear that in the speakers in the room. But the assign buttons, they're up for one, two, but they're pressed down for three, four. So now those signals are going to this fader, which is associated with groups three and group four. And so because I've got track seven and eight armed, if I press play, you're gonna see the signal from here, from these faders, appear in track seven and eight. So if I pull them down, you can still see that there is signal coming from tape, we just can't hear it. But when I turn these faders up, it's sending that signal to seven and eight. So I can bounce those three signals into a stereo pair where that stereo image where one instrument here, one instrument here, and one instrument here is retained on those two channels. So I'm gonna wind back to zero and then hit record and we'll be bouncing. That's the bounce being created on those two channels now. There we go, we've bounced. So if I unarm those tracks, seven and eight, I'm gonna turn down the source tracks. I'm gonna turn the tape position to zero so I'm no longer monitoring them. And instead, I'm going to assign the bus. I'm gonna make it three and four here because that's what the RCA sockets at the back are plugged into so we can hear it through the speakers. Turn these channels up. Panned hard left and right, input sign to be off. Turn these tape to mix. Right, if I rewind it to the right place, that might help. I've got a stereo image. You can hear it. You can't really hear the on that channel, but it's much louder and you can't really hear the synth sound. So there's a stereo image there. I've baked it into two channels. For that stereo image to work, these pan controls must be panned hard left and right. 
turn to zero. Now we're going to do a different kind of bounce where instead of making a stereo image, I'm just going to blend those three tracks, copy them on the track six. So I'm going to turn off sound coming from tape on channel seven and eight and turn them down. I want to arm track six. So I'm going to put it to mix. Track six is connected to group two. So I want group one, two to be depressed for channel six. Six is an even number. So I want that to be panned hard right. I'm going to plug in my sockets at the back into outputs one, two. This would all be audible in the headphones, by the way. You wouldn't have to do this faffing around um, under normal circumstances. And now I'm going to turn on the tape for my original sound source. Um, what I've had to do here is just reassign tracks one, two and four that contain the original mono recording of the three little noise boxes to tracks one and two so that they are directed to group two that contains track six here. So now if I press play, you can see there are signals, but they're not hitting track six unless I put the fader up. And then I'm getting a mixture on track six. If I turn that up pretty loud, you can see it's hitting tape quite loud. So that's how I would achieve my mono bounce. So let's do that now. If we go return to zero, hit record. What's happening now is these three, a blend of them, is going to this track six mono. And I can prove that by, as I go along, slightly changing the balance of the tracks. So we'll hear that, those changes that I'm making to the fade are baked into track six when we come to play it back. So I'm gonna disarm track six. I'm gonna set these tape controls so none of the tape is coming through for any other channel except for track six. Track six, I'm gonna turn the tape control to mix so it's coming through the mixer. It's assigned to button one, two. And so we should hear back our bounce here. I'll, just for no confusion, I'll turn down these other faders. I'll turn to zero first. So that's a blend of all three signals on one track. You hear me change that's the changes in the levels? As long as you're happy with how the bounce sounds before you start overwriting your original materials then it doesn't really matter too much you can keep redoing it until you got it right i'm going to plug the synths back in what i'm going to do this time is i'm going to direct all three signals to track five so i want to put these into mix mode track five is in group one so i want the assign to be set to one two in all these channels if I turn them up, I get a blend that I like. Because 5 is an odd number, and I want to pan all of these hard left. Let's arm track 5. And you can see... the signal hitting that track. And it's not coming from the tape this time. If it was coming from the tape, then we would see these bars moving. So, just to make this really clear, I'm going to fast forward a bit. So we're going to start after 100, so you're absolutely clear that this signal is being recorded separately from the previous combination of things. So, I can start recording now. I'll reset the counter to zero. I've got a new zero on the tape. I can bake fader moves into this. And we'll hear that back on the recording. 30 seconds, well 30 clicks on this counter really. Go return to zero, unarm that track, put the fader back up. We want the tape control to go to mix so we're here monitoring back what happens with the tape and put the pan in the center. There it is. I can move it in the stereo image. I can EQ it. You can hear the fader moves baked into that recording. I'm only doing it with three sound sources, but it's completely possible for you to do that with eight sound sources. 
You can put up to eight sources in any combination, really, you know, if you're clever with it, to up to four tape tracks. Last thing, I think, I keep on saying last thing, final thing, but I think this is the last thing now, for me to demonstrate is how these ascends and returns are working in practice. So over here on the left of the screen, you can see that I've got these two Zoom multi-stomp modelers. Now the bottom one is set up with a stomp delay in it. The output of effect one is going into the input of the pedal and the output of the pedal is going into return channel 9 slash 10 and you can see that I've got that assigned to this master fader here and the levels turned up a bit. The bluer of the two multi stomps has a chamber reverb in it. The output from effect 2 socket on the back it's just about in shot the top of the screen is going into the input of the effect pedal and the output of the effect pedal is coming up here and coming back into the mixer on 11.12. So that's a stereo input. It's actually a monaural output on these pedals. So effectively, it's sitting dead center of the stereo field. If I had stereo output from these and a tip ring sleeve, that is a three part socket, then that would work. And if there was a balance control on the effect, then that would work. And I could get the effect return to sit somewhere in the stereo image in that way. But I don't have that facility, so I won't be demonstrating that today. So effectively what this means is, say this track here that's got the horrible synth sound on it. If I turn it to the left, then it's going through the delay pedal. If I turn the effect knob to the right, then it's going through the reverb. So I'll just demonstrate that now. I mean, this is a cumulative with effect one and effect two. You can see I've got them set at slightly different levels. It's just because it's possible to actually completely overdrive these pedals because they, we will add gain at this stage. So this is just how much the signal is coming out of these output sockets and into the pedal and how much is coming back from the pedals and into the mix that we can hear is set by these controls up here. So because it's a continuous sound, it's a little bit hard to hear the decay of the reverb and the delay. So I'll play them and stop them a couple of times. So, so that's not, no effect on it. I turn it this way. Hear that reverb? If I turn it in this direction, I'm going to get a delay on it. So at this point, sending these uh, effects to either the echo or the reverb is an option for any track that's got sound on it. So if I turn up instead this signal, I can put reverb on that. Or I can put delay on it. Got to return that to zero, run out of tape again. switch between them. Kind of sounds cool actually. Quite dubby. Got a track for reverb to the right. Echo to the left. You get the idea. And the thing is, if I assign this to a bus that's being recorded on. So if it's like the left one, two, and I've got, say, tracks one and two armed or five and six armed, then I'm going to end up recording the sound of the effects as well as whatever's playing back through the mixer. So it's totally possible while you're laying down tracks or while you're overdubbing or while you're bouncing to add effects and print them into tape. It's a destructive way of editing because you can't control the levels afterward, but it can be quite fun. It can be quite interesting. It's a way when you've only got a couple of effect loops that you can add layers of effects as you continue through your recording. Um, you can get happy accidents that way, but, you know, I suppose it's better if you plan it. I mean, I think most people will leave the effect until they're mixing down their final recording. But I just want to make you aware that it is totally possible to add effects in layers during the entire recording process.
This wasn't really a review. I'm going to do a separate review where I kind of gloss over the details of the mixer, but I just thought that this was such a difficult mixer to use, but such a powerful mixer, it kind of deserved its own video. So I hope this is helpful to anyone who wants to understand the mixer technology that is attached to multi-track cassette recorders better in general, but you know specifically to this unit, I hope that if you have watched all the way through this video, you're now in a position where you feel confident that you know what you're doing with all these switches and buttons.